Uh, well, tonight we're talking about Jesus on suffering. And uh, before we begin, I'd just like to offer a word of prayer and I invite you to bow your heads with me as we begin. Father in heaven, we plead with you now, asking, Lord, that you help us to comprehend your word. And we ask you, dear Father, that you may be our teacher tonight and that you may guide us through uh, these portions of scripture that we'll be looking at. We pray that your witness may speak, and we ask you, dear Father, that we may come now at your feet and learn from you is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Many of you probably already recognize that I'm a reader. I love to read books, and some of the students uh, sort of joke around every now and then, saying, Pastor Jermaine is bound to recommend another book for them to read. I do love reading books. And I was reading this particular book not so long ago about the story of two missionaries. They were actually in the Philippines. This was in the year 2001. Um, the Burnham family, they had uh, been there in the Philippines for several years, and they were working with some of the tribes there. The husband was a missionary pilot. They had flown to different portions or different places in the Philippines. In their 40s, they decided that after they received a short break that they would take a, a short vacation to celebrate their 20th anniversary. They went to an island, sort of a deserted island, actually 18th anniversary, and it was an island in the, Phili in the Philippines. They were there staying in rooms that were on stilts. They were, they were actually on the water. When one morning they heard a loud knocking at the door. And they figured it might be room service. It turned out it wasn't room service. In fact, it, were, it was, it was uh, three men with N16 guns. And that's when the ordeal started. They were captured, kidnapped, while celebrating their 18th anniversary. Missionaries kidnapped in the Philippines. I have um, on the screen, uh, this is actually one of the news articles that, were, that was published during that time, and this one was, I uh, was able to, to, to snatch it from Christianity Today. When they were talking about the experience, the ordeal, when it finally ended, actually ended a year, a full year later, they were taken captive for 365 days walking through the jungles of the Philippines, serving God, captured while serving God. The article stated that on the day that they were rescued, there was a gunfight. And on that very day where they were supposed to experience freedom, the husband got shot and killed, and only the wife survived. Can you imagine that? Suffering, pain. We see it every day. We hear about it. And while I'm on the subject, I think of some friends even, who were recently, their helicopter went down in the Philippines. And we're still praying for and still hoping that we can find those individuals. Pain and suffering. It seems to show up every now and then, doesn't it? And the world has busied itself trying to figure out or find an answer to this great ordeal, this experience of suffering. By the way, I'm going to recommend the book, because I think it's a very good read. I have it on the screen. It's called In the Presence of My Enemies a book that will both challenge and encourage your faith. Their experience is just so profound, so, so, so deep and so powerful that some of the questions that are raised in the book really points your attention to a deeper study and a deeper experience with your God. The Lord you serve. Because really, we don't experience these kind of sufferings. And sometimes, if you were to measure yours, Compared to what others are experiencing, you realize how small your sufferings are. And so I like reading these stories. 
because they remind me that the world is much bigger than my small space. So I do recommend the book. It's actually very good. I have a quote from the book. This is what she said from Gracia Burnham. While she's walking through the jungles of the, of the Philippines, walking behind these uh, Taliban, these, these, these soldiers who are Muslims, uh, uh, taking her into, these, in, into this, these, these crazy places, daily gun battles. And they were taken for ransom. There are about, actually, about 20 people taken, if I'm not mistaken, and they were among the 20. And those who had money were freed earlier. But these two missionaries were poor, so they had no money, and they ended up staying for a full year until they were rescued. In fact, they were among the last to be rescued because there was no ransom money to be paid. She says, I realize that when everything is stripped away from you and you have nothing, you find out what you really are down deep inside. What I was starting to see, she says in myself, was not pretty. Her experience of suffering for her became a mirror through which she could see the depths of her soul and her experience. And by the way, it is when we suffer that we find ourselves asking the question, does God really exist? Isn't that usually when we ask that question? You look deep inside. Even people of faith who trust and worship God for many years find themselves asking, does God exist when I suffer? What's so, what's so profound about suffering that everyone tries to, to make sense of it? I, I, I figure life is like um, a plant in a desert. One of the um, craziest places on earth, as far as deserts are concerned, is the Sahara. Did you know temperatures go up to about 136 degrees Fahrenheit in the Sahara Desert. Anyone want to go? Probably not. Did you know that in the Sahara Desert, there's only one inch of rain every year? Can you imagine that? One inch, something like about that. Every year, per year. The Sahara Desert is not just brutal for its temperature. The Sahara Desert is actually brutal because of the wind as well. And in fact, they said every year about a hundred ton of dust is picked up from the Sahara Desert and blown over the ocean and oftentimes in other countries. The Sahara Desert. This is where I feel like uh, this is a perfect example, I feel, of the world. In this place that you, you find yourself in, in the middle of chaos, Losing control. And I wonder, I wonder why the story of deliverance for the Israelites actually happened in a desert. God took them through that journey. Sort of an illustration of how our life is sometimes. The wind may blow, the heat may, 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 may rise, and the nights can be bitter cold when we experience trial. Everyone tries their very best to either make sense of suffering or to find escape from suffering, or both. By the way, this picture, you might notice there's a tree in the middle of the desert. Does anyone know what kind of tree this is? It's called an acacia tree. And by the way, that was the tree that God used in the sanctuary. By the way, the acacia uh, tends to grow in these um, arid, dry places, and they're very hard wood. For some reason, they develop the capability to live and abide in these desolate places. And I wonder if God is teaching us to be like the acacia sometimes, where he uses us for his own glory when we suffer. Notice the world. If you were to adopt the worldview of a Hindu, how they view suffering... They say suffering is punishment for the deeds done in a previous life. And the way to escape it is settling your accounts. In other words, the previous life is whatever comes back to you is the karma, karma that you deserve. And what you need to do in order to escape suffering, you need to settle your accounts or paying the past misdeeds, the soul's next 
reincarnation will be more enjoyable if you pay off your debt. That's how Hindus try to work out or reconcile suffering. Buddhists, they say that we suffer because of spiritual ignorance and our inaccurate perceptions of the world and of what it means to be human. The way to escape this ignorance, they say, is to get past suffering by not clinging to material things, not even your relationships. The Muslim says that suffering is there so that you may learn to submit to the will of Allah. The way to escape it is by good works. And when you get to paradise, you'll realize how good life is, having done your very best in this life. The Sikhs tell us that when you suffer, it is because God is trying to teach you to not be self-centered. And therefore, the way to escape it is to try to be fearless and active in your revolt against cruelty and injustice in the world. And perhaps by doing that, you can escape suffering. There are others who still believe that suffering is brought into the world by religions. And so they say, in order to get rid of suffering, you need to purge the world of all religion. And that would remove suffering. That's what the atheists say. That America could be a better place if there were no religions at all. Can you imagine a world like that? But friends, this, is, this actually points out that in the human psyche, the human mind, there is a desire to escape this idea, this experience of suffering. I can see on your faces when I share the story of the missionaries that something happened. The question might even be raised in your mind. Why missionaries captured while on vacation? Suffering. It is tough to even engage in a conversation regarding suffering. In fact, that's one thing we all have in common. We all suffer. You might even think back to one of your own experiences where you've experienced suffering yourself. We all suffer. The death of a loved one, some disease brought on, or whatever the case may be. I just imagine Jesus, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, we're in Matthew chapter 5, and yesterday, we, last night, we talked about his teachings, his doctrine, and the importance of it is bringing freedom into the world. And notice at this point in Jesus' experience, and by the way, he is still not very far from the synagogue where he had taught and freed a man who was possessed. He is still in the area, the region of Capernaum. And the Bible tells us here in Matthew, actually if you'll back up with me to Matthew chapter 4, and we'll read verse 23. There the Bible tells us, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. What happened as a result of his work? Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the what? All sick people who were afflicted with various what? Diseases and torments. And those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics. And he did what? Heal them. Jesus brought together all the sufferers. Everyone who was suffering came to Jesus for some kind of help. And the Bible tells that Jesus offered some help. In fact, he healed them. And this begins, friends, the most profound sermon that would ever be given, the Beatitudes. These suffering souls coming to the hill on the north side of Capernaum, the city of comfort, these comfortless people coming to Jesus asking for help. And Jesus, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, he sees the multitude in their condition with their heavy hearts, burdened. He sees this brother who is trying to make his way there blind. And the Bible tells us that Jesus begins now. Matthew chapter 5, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. 
Verse 2, then he opened his mouth and did what? Taught them saying. Jesus began teaching the sufferers, those who were suffering from all kinds of maladies. And he tells them, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And when you read this, oftentimes you think, oh, this is so sweet, it's so nice. It's worthy of being hung on the wall, or, 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 or let me make sure there's a nice place to put this word, blessed are. But we don't realize how radical this teaching is, because for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious sects back then, they thought that suffering came as a result of sin, personal sins. And we think of one story in particular, that one in John chapter 9, the man who was blind from birth. When the disciples were walking by, they asked Jesus a question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? And in a society like this, with shame and honor, can you imagine a blind man walking the streets of Galilee, what people would think of him? He is blind because he is a sinner. He is blind because his parents did something wrong. He is suffering because he did something or his parents did something. And so the burden was laid on the individual to solve their own problems. But Jesus now comes and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. When they thought that poverty was a sign that you did something wrong and God had no interest in you. But Jesus is saying the opposite. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is so radical, such a radical teaching. But notice what else he does, and this is the point we're coming to. Verse 9, blessed are the, what's the word there, verse 9? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Are you a peacemaker? Anyone here? Yeah, peacemaker, yeah, yeah. You don't like fights. Anyone avoid confrontation? Right, yeah. oh, oh, man, don't get me in a confrontation. Oh, yeah, yeah, peacemakers. You know, you want to make sure everyone is happy in your presence. It's just, we're peacemakers. We want the world to be peaceful. In fact, we try our very best to maintain peace in everything we do. But how often do peacemakers experience suffering? Jesus goes on, by the way. He says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those, he goes on, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying the peacemakers eventually experience persecution. You know what we often do? We say that if we keep the peace, there will be no problems. If I'm a peacemaker, that means that I ought not to suffer. If I am a child of God, that means there's no suffering in my future. But that's not what Jesus says. And by the way, the Beatitudes, in other words, this is like the pinnacle of what he's saying. He comes to this point, blessed are the peacemakers. This is what we obtain in a relationship with God because peace is not owned by us. It is given by the Prince of Peace. And he gives, us, he gives us peace that passes all understanding. But friends, you have to realize that God's peace does not remove external difficulties. No wonder why he places his peace within. Because he knows the world is a terrible place. And if you and I have peace within us, nothing that happens on the outside will shake us. So Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, happy are they who are peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And notice what happens, they are called the sons of God under what condition? When they're persecuted, suffering. Verse 11, Jesus says, blessed are you when they revile, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. He says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for, they, for so they persecuted the prophets who were, what? Before you. Remember we talked about those witnesses. Um, by the way, 
We'll spin the stool around. Now, I'll ask you a question. How many prophets do you know in the Bible who were killed? Okay? Right? So even John, by the way, Jesus mentioned the four witnesses. John the baptizer, how did he die? He was beheaded. Did John the baptizer suffer? Yeah. I mean, you can think about how many prophets throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament and after Jesus died that suffered. Even Peter himself, Paul. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Can you think of, let's go broader, even broader. Can you think of, how, can you think of any Christian throughout the centuries that suffered or who suffered? Yeah? Anyone? Throw out a name. You're... Ellen White, yes, yes. Anyone else? I mean, you might even throw out your own name. Yeah, me, I suffered. You know? But you can think of many names. Um, and I, I mentioned before, Peter, crucified upside down. Um, one really good book that catalogs the experience of these guys is Fox's Book of Martyr. He traces the journey of James and John and all of these guys, John himself, the revelator, was, he was uh, banished to the Isle of Patmos after being, uh, after being burned, after being uh, burned with hot oil. Can you, be, can you imagine that? And we talked about all those who were um, even torn by beasts in, the, in, in those, 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 those um, what are they called, those uh, Roman Colosseums. Oh, there's immense suffering for, for Christians. And what they would do they would actually cover them in the skins of animals and set beasts upon them. I mean, Christians endure, I mean, harsh kinds of sufferings, don't they? From your reading. And they're the peacemakers. Because you can't think of a true Christian that probably in his moment of suffering, can you imagine Daniel um, in going down in the lion's den and he grabs his sword and cuts a few guys like, hey guys, don't throw me down here. Right? The story would read very different. In fact, you might not have a lot of confidence in Daniel. Right? You might look at Daniel very differently. Can you imagine Christians fighting wars in order to defend Christ's honor? In fact, Jesus himself didn't fight. He was a peacemaker. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, the Bible tells us there, if you'll turn there with me, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, the Bible describes to us Jesus is coming into this world. How do we analyze this idea of suffering? Because Jesus presents to us somewhat of an oxymoronic idea. Peacemakers suffering. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. The Bible tells us, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. At this moment in the Beatitudes, Jesus is actually giving the people a glimpse of what he would experience and what they would experience in following him. Friends, suffering is something important that we need to talk about. It's one thing to suffer, but it's another thing to suffer for doing the right thing. And usually when we experience suffering having done the right thing, we think it is unjust, it is injustice done to me. I did everything I was supposed to do, and now I am suffering. Why? We all suffer, don't we? And as it, like I said, most world religions try to analyze that, and they place the emphasis on the person, the man. He needs to solve his own problem of suffering. He needs to work his way out of his suffering. That's the only way he finds freedom. But Jesus says, at the summit of your Christianity, you experience suffering there too. A Christian, on his best day, still suffers. Then we have to have another, have another view then. We have to look at it a little differently. Jesus gives us some, uh, some clear ideas with regard to this. If you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, the Bible tells us there, we're going to be reading from verse 24. 
Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is explaining the kingdom of heaven and how things are viewed from God's perspective. Another parable the Bible tells us he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who does what? Sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. When the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Jesus describes the kind of world we live in, the type of desert we are in. Not only do we come face to face with the, with the, the conditions and the climate, now we come face to face with enemies. And by the way, in the Sahara, the year 2021, over 700 people were kidnapped in the Sahara Desert. Can you imagine that? Despite the arid climate and the, the, the craziness of the environment alone, even there, people are getting kidnapped. So Jesus tells us, there's an enemy. And just like uh, the book, in the presence of my enemies, you and I live in the presence of enemies. So Jesus tells us, there's an enemy. You may be a peacemaker, a good seed, but there, are, there is an enemy. And by the way, uh, this is very, very unique, and I love this in terms of what we believe. Because when we deal with the subject of suffering, the one way that we frame it is within the framework of this thought, this idea called the great controversy. A war between good and evil, a war between Christ and Satan. And Jesus tells us here, it actually explains to us a little bit later in the book of Matthew. If you'll go now with me, you're in Matthew chapter 13. Let's go now to verse 37. He answered and said, He who sows the good seed is the who? The Son of Man. And the Son of Man is in reference to Jesus himself. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the what? Wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the? The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So Jesus gives us the interpretation of the parable. We are dealing with an enemy, and the enemy identified is the devil. You know one thing the devil hates? Peace. Wherever he shows up, he tries to remove peace. If you look in your Bibles, in the book of Revelation, if you'll turn it with me, Revelation chapter 12, we can identify that the devil actually started a war in one of the most peaceful places ever. Heaven. The Bible tells Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, and war broke out in bliss. The place of bliss. And war broke out in heaven of all places. This is not the Sahara. This is paradise. The best place to be. This is where we all want to go. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. And if you ever want to know who Michael is, we can probably ask, uh, you can ask a question, we can answer it for you. And the dragon and his angels fought. The Bible tells us again, in verse 8, my clicker doesn't always work, but if you could take me to verse 8. Uh, the Bible tells us, uh, and the dragon and his angels fought, and they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And verse 9, who is the, dra who is the dragon? The devil and Satan. The serpent of old. Going all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. He showed up in the most peaceful garden, the most beautiful place that mankind could ever be placed. And there, division, derision, peace was robbed. The world was forever changed. And outside of the gates of that very Eden that God had made for mankind, the first crime was committed, the first murder, the death of a son, and the death of a brother. Peace was taken from the world. And God himself stated, there is no peace, saith my Lord, for the wicked. 
Satan is seeking to rob the world of peace, and Jesus is trying to full, fill the world of, with peacemakers. So in this whole saga of suffering, God wants you to be a peacemaker because peace is the greatest illustration of God's power and His glory and His ability in the world in this desert. That's why He says, blessed are the peacemakers, because their mission is so powerful. Blessed are the peacemakers, because even though you may have a big enemy, you still have a big friend, an even bigger friend. And a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Blessed are the peacemakers, because he himself is the prince of peace, and every child of his belongs to his kingdom. So even when we suffer, we can identify ourselves with the suffering servant who is himself the peacemaker who died on Calvary's cross. You see, the Hindus tell us, escape suffering. Work your way up to God. But God tells us, Christ himself stated, he came down to us. It's the opposite. He comes into the Sahara to suffer with us. Every year... And I don't know if it's still every year, but usually uh, NASA, NASA, they do a, a type of training with the astronauts. And this training is usually used for team building activities. They want to um, highlight or encourage a certain type of trust in each person because when you go out in space, the one important ingredient you need is trust. Because one mistake can cost the lives of many. And so they take these individuals into the desert, actually, to do this training. And they provide one map, and they provide a leader in the group who really is not identified as the leader. He is experienced, he's gone through the desert before, but this new team who, has to, who have to work together in space, one of them, they're given the map, and they have to figure out navigating the desert. And the leader is silenced the whole time, and he watches what takes place. And so they would argue one with another, and they would go on the wrong journey and would end up actually suffering as a team. And the whole purpose is to, is to understand how to trust each other and, your, and the decisions that are being made. And the leader still remains quiet through the entire journey. You know what's crazy about this leader? Wherever they go, he goes with them. Whatever they experience, he experiences it with them too. Most religions tell us God is separate from our sufferings and we ought to work it out. We ought to find peace. We ought to find freedom. But Jesus is like that leader. He actually comes in it and guides us through it. And that's why I say the story of the Israelites going through the desert is so profound to me because their experience going through the desert actually includes God coming close to them. What was he? A cloud by day, fire by night. He was the light producer, producer in their darkest time. He was a shade to them during the hottest portion of the day. Oh, friends, we need God in our sufferings, don't we? But what's interesting is that most religions place the blame on humanity. But Jesus identifies something even more important, that there's someone who is even more sinister he says, going all the way back in time, him dealing with a situation with this same enemy, the devil. If you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28. The Bible tells us there of the devil and his intention. Ezekiel chapter 28, the Bible gives us sort of an analogy in reference to a king, Ezekiel 28, the Bible tells us, starting in verse 13, this same individual, this same um, devil, Lucifer, was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. God tells him, you're in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was their covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was 
prepared for you on the day you were created. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were imperfect. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till what? Iniquity was found in you. Then he started working. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence. Where does it begin? Within. And you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. This same agent had violence within. One of the most profound quotes I ever read says this, that Satan hates God so much that he would do whatever it takes to hurt the the people that God loves the most. That's how much he hates God. Turn to me now in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. Here we find him again. The Bible describing him. This same enemy. Notice his desires, his, his, his plans, his aspirations, his hopes. Isaiah chapter 14. The Bible tells us in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. It goes on. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. If you ever pay attention to all the personal pronouns and how many times the word I is mentioned, it outlines the plan of Satan. All he cares about is himself. No one else, nothing else, all he cares about is himself. But in the the opposite side of the spectrum, you find Christ himself coming to this world. And the conclusion when he died on Calvary's cross, as people looked at him there, um, hanging on that hard wood, they concluded that he saved others himself he could not save. And Jesus himself told Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All he cares about is you. Satan cares about himself. But Jesus cares about you. To the point where he's willing to die if that's what it took. You know who would never die for you? The devil. So why suffering? Why does he go through with it? And yes, usually we think the devil is some sort of an image uh, with a pitchfork. Um, But friends, it's more sinister than that. He's behind the scenes, often misidentified, and he enjoys that. I heard recently, actually, that there was a festival all the way in Brazil where they literally celebrated the devil. But I want to take you back. Just imagine with me. And I took this uh, picture from uh, uh, actually a very popular movie nowadays, um, series, I I think, um, called The Chosen. Probably you recognize that, right? And the idea, they actually talked about how much it took to create the scene of the Sermon on the Mount and how intense that was to do, but... Really, I want to take your minds back to that moment again. Just imagine those people coming to Jesus, looking for an answer, a solution to their problems. And Jesus, on the pinnacle of his teaching, tells them that where I want to take you, this place that God has designated, designed for you, is the place where you are a peacemaker. But even there, you will suffer. But you're suffering is not in vain. 
there's a reason and there's something to be accomplished through that experience. There is discipline in suffering. Jesus himself suffered. There is glory in suffering because Jesus glorified it. The cross is never the same because Jesus hung on it. Do you realize that? Even gangsters wear a cross around their neck. But that's not the real deal. But Jesus brought honor to the most cruel type of punishment there is. Oh, friends, if you go with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, it tells us why he did it. Isaiah 53, the Bible tells us, actually in uh, predicting the life of Christ and the suffering of Christ, the Bible tells us in verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him not. Yet we esteemed him, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, do you see the next word? For our, what? Peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. When Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, he is saying, peace comes as a result of my paying for it. That's God. You are a peacemaker because Jesus paid for your peace. The God who suffers the God who suffers. And so when we think about suffering, we can go to a place like the Apostle Paul went. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you go there with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we understand that the devil would prefer that we give up in the middle of our trials and our experiences. But the Bible teaches, teaches us that there is something else that we can do. Paul tells us of his experience in verse 7, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, meaning the blessings he had received, this man who was a peacemaker, who was first a war, a warlike individual, Paul realizes that even in his experience of suffering, there's something else that could be seen. He said, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning the thing I pleaded with the Lord, how many times? Three times. Paul was a prayer warrior. We've seen many occasions on which he got answers to his prayers, but this one, the answer was different. And he said unto me, verse 9, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Peacemakers may get tired, but there is additional strength from the one who gives the best kind of strength. Paul says, my perspective has changed. My response to my suffering is different now. Therefore, most gladly, he says, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. But then he adds... I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Imagine that perspective in suffering. When I'm thrown down, cast down, burdened, that's when I find true strength in God. There's another view. Paul again. Let's go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. The Bible tells us there. Acts. Romans chapter 5. 
The Bible tells us in verse 1, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have what again, everyone? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But then he says that this grace, this purchased peace, this access to faith, and not only that, this is what it does for us. We also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The deeper the suffering, it seems, the deeper the love experienced. And you can ask any of those individuals I mentioned before, even the Burnham family, they found out in their moment of suffering the depths of God's love to the point where they were willing to even pray for their captors. That is some kind of experience and response to suffering. But not only that, God doesn't just leave us there. He doesn't just say glory in it. He doesn't just say celebrate or be joyful in your moment of suffering. Not only does it produce patience and perseverance and all these good things, He also gives you something else. 2 Corinthians, if you go there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Bible tells us that God gives us a type of experience that is so profound we have to read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible tells us there, we're reading verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. There the Apostle Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father for our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what, everyone? Mercies and the God of what? All comfort who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by who? There are some kinds of pain that no human being can comfort us in. But God says, you know what? I'll take on myself the business of comforting you. And then he says in addition to that, I am doing this not just for you, but for someone else who may go through similar experience or similar experience that you're going through right now. So not only does he comfort us, he then gives us a mission when we get on the other side of our suffering. And sometimes even during our suffering. This is God. This is who he is to us. Paul says that there's something else too. Oh, friends, we can go all night on this subject, but I won't keep you. Uh, there's another text we need to look at. It's in the, in, in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Oh, there's so many that we could observe. But friends, notice the next, the next experience with suffering. There is that discipline. There is that glory. There is that joy. There is that comfort. But friends, nothing surpasses this other point. And this is what I love. Philippians chapter 3, the Bible tells us here in verse 10 that what comes on account of our suffering. And by the way, actually, let's back up to verse 8 if, you, if you're there with me. He says, this is the, the Apostle Paul, he says, Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have, what's the next word, everyone? Suffered the what? The loss of how many things? All things. How many of you ever suffered the loss of all things? How many of you have ever suffered the loss of something or some things? Some of you have. What is your perspective usually when you suffer losses? How do you look at them? You're probably thinking, Lord, I can't believe this happened. I just lost the most important thing in my life. 
But notice Paul. How does he view them? He says, I suffered the loss of all things and count them as what? Rubbish. Man, these things in life that we value so much. Like, can you imagine, like, losing your car? How often when we, you know, the car breaks down, our response is like, oh, this car is not rubbish. This is like the best thing that ever happened to me. The Apostle Paul is like, the more I suffer, the more I really realize what's really needed or what's most important. He says, I count them rubbish that I may gain who? Christ. So he finds the thing that's most valuable or the person that's most valuable, that I may gain Christ. Notice what else he says, verse 9. Verse 9, I read from my Bible here. It says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God, by faith, and then resulting in this, the Bible tells us in verse 10, the fellowship that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. This is the ultimate fellowship with God in suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The Apostle Paul says, in my suffering, what I see that's most valuable is my ability and the opportunity to have fellowship with God. How about we start building an altar in our places of suffering? And praising God for the experience in that he draws so close to us to guide us through this experience. Jesus does not ignore suffering. He comes into the midst of it. And there he prays. There he stays. There he delivers. And there he dies. But that's not the end of it. There is still a resurrection ahead of us. And while most religions focus on the reward, you and I can think as we understand what suffering really means, we can focus on the experience with God now. Because there is that. God provides it. God provides it. So you and I, we don't need to hang our heads. We don't need to give up. I have a picture in closing I want to show you. My clicker doesn't work. Can we go to the last slide, please? This, by the way, is a very important picture. Last one. All right. Yep, here it is. Can anyone, do you know what this is? Huh? This is Las Vegas. This is actually Las Vegas from space. What they discovered is that Las Vegas is actually the, bright, the brightest place on earth. Isn't that interesting? The lights of Las Vegas are so bright. Do you see the center of that? It's pure white. If you ever look at a map of the United States, they recognize that this place is so bright. But what's crazy about that is that this light is shining in one of the darkest places in America. Friends, this can be you and I. As we are in this dark world, we can be the light that shines in the middle of darkness. When we realize these important factors and these important things that God gives to us in our moments of suffering, we can be as bright as this place. Oh, friends, may heaven look down on us and see that light shining so bright in the midst of our dark, deserted world. Do you want to be that kind of light? in the middle of your suffering, then I invite you to stand with me as we pray to close. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we seldom think of suffering as a privilege. We seldom think of it as an experience that was designed to bring us closer to you. We seldom think of it as a space that you yourself enters to 
who experience suffering with us. But Father, tonight, what we ask of you, just like you told those people on that hillside that day, that as we are peacemakers in this world, as we suffer, that we may be the light set on a hill, not covered, not hidden, but shining so brightly that others may see and glorify their Father who is in heaven. This is our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.